so let's see it's five over after five we've already got a bunch of people i think we'll probably get started um out of um respect to dr fong's time um and the way that i want to do this is just to tell you um how far back my own personal relationship goes with larry um i'm fortunate enough to to to, to be able to say that um that uh, Larry never treated me personally, thank goodness. Um, but he did treat several people that I navigated um, and who became very close to me. And through that, I got to know Larry very well. And um, I, uh, as I mentioned, Larry is not only a brilliant researcher, and for those of you who are on the line who um have a knowledge of prostate cancer and most of you most of you will have heard of provenge and, and larry was the principal investigator on provenge which was the first cancer vaccine ever to be approved back in 2010 um that's our only that that's only a a a a, a, a small inkling of his credentials um but he is also, and I can truly say this, he's one of the most, if not the most compassionate clinician that I've ever had the good fortune to meet. The bad news is Larry's not doing a lot of um, clinical work anymore, so we can't really send patients to him, but um, it, it's heartwarming to, to be in his presence. And if you have any doubt about that, you only have to look at the picture um, that I stole from the UCSF um, web pages um, that they used um, with, with that broad beaming smile that really makes patients feel good. And, and the, the story behind the picture that I referenced, uh, the Superman picture, is that um, I started navigating a fellow around 2012 who was a Kaiser patient who lived in Emeryville in uh, California. And he became a very, very close friend of mine um, over the five years that he lived, um, four to five years that he lived. And um, he was an actor, he was an artisan carpenter and a general contractor. He was overall a very, very talented guy and he had a great sense of humor. So um, back around, I think it was 2012 or 13, Larry would probably remember better than me. Um, this friend of ours, a patient of, patient of Larry's friend of mine, Jerry, um, did Provenge. And at that time, um, it, it, was, it was not difficult to get Provenge, but it wasn't as common as it is today. And um, Jerry had an appointment coming up with Larry um, right after the end of his third ProBench session. And it happened to be on Halloween. So he, had a, he got in his truck over in Emeryville and he dressed himself up as Superman and he drove over to the, uh, to the campus in, uh, at UCSF and he got out and he walked through the campus as... Uh, a Superman and he showed up for his appointment dressed as Superman and, and that's how come we have the pictures. We also have some pictures of stethoscopes being placed on Superman's back and, and, and what more. But um, it was, I think, um, a very enjoyable moment. It certainly was for Jerry. I think it was for Larry too. I don't think he's ever treated Superman before. Um, with that, I'd like to um, I'd like to pass you along to Larry. I just should should add that currently he is the um, co-director and uh, medical director of the UCSF Immuno Oncology Program, which is a beneficiary and part of the Parker Institute, uh, which was set up about three years ago, I guess, by Sean Parker um, to um, encourage uh, research into immuno-oncology. Um, Larry, I'm going to make you presenter. 
Um, I'm going to ask everybody else to turn their webcams off at this point in time, and um, and we'll turn the screen over to you. Okay, terrific. All right. Um, so, so th those were really uh, kind words, Rick. I think um, you know this is this is something that um, you know taking care of folks really motivates us in terms of what we what we do and. You know, I, I do um, am continuing to see patients, but I'm seeing uh, patients in the context of the immunotherapy program at UCSF. And uh, this program is really focused on bringing state-of-the-art immunotherapies um, uh, to patients. And um, uh, it's not tied to any one specific disease. So it's not specific for prostate cancer per se, but it's really focused on different diseases where we're, we're studying immunotherapies. Um, and so this is the outline of um, the, the slides that I just wanted to review. Rick um, had instructed to give um, perhaps a, a, a quick overview in terms of uh, immunotherapies, and uh, then we could go to questions. And so I was going to start out with a background on cancer immunotherapy in terms of the history and how we think about the cancer and the immune system um, in the form of a cycle. And then I was going to talk about three immunotherapeutic approaches that have made their way into the clinic. Um, and um, those are immune checkpoint inhibition, T cell therapies, and then to finish uh, with vaccines. So if we go to the next slide. So um, this is a, 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 a timeline that you know keeps getting revised in terms of um, um, you know progress with regards to immunotherapies really um, the notion that we could use the immune system to treat cancer stemmed from William Coley um, back in the late 1800s who used um, a bacteria to actually serve as a cancer vaccine by infecting tumor sites but you can sort of fast forward over time to the 1990s, where we had cytokine therapies, um, uh, including IL-2. And then we sort of fast forward to 2010, when Cipolus LT or Provenge was uh, FDA approved, um, sort of the first, um, you know, cancer vaccine, um, as, as Rick had mentioned. And then the next year, anti-CK4 antibodies were FDA approved for metastatic melanoma. And that really um, uh, led to a new phase in terms of immunotherapies where we now have immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so the, the next checkpoint um, that um, drugs were approved against is PD-1. And so that's in uh, 2014. And um, at the, that same year, there was also evidence that CAR T cell therapy, which I'll talk about as well, um, was actually active, and that's now an FDA-approved therapy. But really, now what's happened is is um, these immunotherapies are now transforming the way we care um, for patients with cancer. So if you, we go on to the next slide, um, th this basically shows um, you know recognition of the impact of immunotherapies from scientific journals such as Science and Nature to really mainstream. Um, uh, um, articles in Time Magazine and in um, the New York Times that have highlighted how um, immunotherapies can really make a huge impact uh, in patients in whom um, these treatments um, work. And so if we scroll to the next um, uh, slide. So when we think about immunotherapies, as I mentioned, in 2005, we had cytokine therapies that worked in a small proportion of patients with melanoma and kidney cancer. If you fast forward to today, we now have immunotherapies for a broad range of cancers. And, um, you know, the, the critical point here is not only do you have cancers that are relatively rare, which are um, cancers like melanoma and kidney cancer, you now are having very common cancers um, uh, uh, where we're using immunotherapies. And so we, we touched briefly on prostate cancer, but lung cancer, now if you are, heaven forbid, newly diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer, the first line therapy for lung cancer is immunotherapy. And so the same thing is true 
with other types of cancer where um, uh, these these immunotherapies are now approved in settings where um, the cancer is no longer responding to other treatments, but slowly they're actually migrating to become frontline therapy. So in addition to lung cancer, we think about, you know, melanoma, kidney cancer. Um, if you look at um, the bottom line, um, any MSI solid tumor, so any cancer that has these DNA repair defects, immunotherapy is really the, the treatment of choice. And, um, you know, we're looking at this list, you know, continuing to expand over time. But one of the things that's very gratifying for me is at the medical school, we now teach cancer immunotherapy um, in the initial class that, um, you know, medical students, you know, com coming um, uh, get exposed to as one of the examples where, you know, therapies are really being transformed um, by the basic sciences. So if we Scroll to the next slide. This slide highlights the components of the immune system. And so on, on the left side in the, in the light purple um, uh, oval, we have components of the immune system that we describe as innate immune cells. These are cells that are already wired in our body to um, um, uh, respond and kill off um, foreign invaders. Um, and um, these really give an immediate response. And so among these are cells, you know, for instance, the neutrophil that's on the bottom, which is a critical infection fighting cell. And then we also have other cells here, like natural killer cells, macrophages, dendritic cells. These are cells that basically take up proteins from um, these foreign invaders, and they really transition over to um, uh, inducing what's called the adaptive immune response, which is the pink or the, the right side of the slide, that induces cells like T cells and B cells and educates them so that the immune system then um, can recognize these um, pathogens at a later time when a person's re-exposed to them. It's really that latter arm, the adaptive immune response that a lot of our immune you know, therapies for cancer are targeting and really trying to take advantage of the immune system's fine specificity um, uh, in terms of discriminating between a tumor cell versus a, a normal cell. So if we scroll down to the, to the next slide, um, we have like the innate versus adaptive immunity. And as I mentioned, innate immunity is the first line of defense it really is um, an immediate uh, defense um, if, for instance, you have an, an infection. Um, but there's no what we call immunologic memory. In other words, the immune system doesn't um, um, alter itself to um, uh, attack these better the next time around. With regards to the adaptive immunity, which is on the right side, it's what we call antigen specific. So in other words, the immune cells actually learn to recognize what they should target. These are those T and D cells. And importantly, um, the first time the immune system sees um, uh, these targets, it actually may not recognize them. And it takes time for the immune system to actually um, uh, recognize and learn how to target um, these antigens. But once it does so, it develops what we call lifelong immunity so that um, people basically um, can uh, um, have their immune system constantly on the lookout. And it's really this type of immunity that we're after in the context of cancer. And, um, you know, when we think about vaccination, the goal here is really to educate the immune system so that we can induce these immune cells to target the cancer, but also to induce uh, lifelong immunity. So if we go to the next slide. So, you know, with the next slide, um, this is the cancer immunity cycle. This is this notion that within a, a person, you have a tumor, which is, you know, the orange cell down on the bottom, and that 
cell basically is shedding proteins because tumor cells constantly grow and they also constantly die. And, um, you know, proteins shed from these tumors can be taken up by what's called these uh, antigen presenting cells, um, uh, which are also, you know, called uh, dendritic cells. And um, uh, uh, they can um, prime uh, uh, T cells. These are the blue and the red cells to um, recognize this target. And, you know, the hope is that our bodies are doing this on their own. But what happens is that after our bodies generate these T cells, they may actually circul circulate back to the tumor. And so these are those blue cells going back to the orange cell. And, um, and uh, basically, they're getting shut down um, by the tumor cells via whatever mechanism. And the one that's highlighted here is, is basically PD-1, which represents an off switch for these T cells. Um, so if we scroll to the next slide. So with, with cancer immunotherapy, what we would want to do is basically co-opt this system whereby we could think about using um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so in this case, highlighting anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 antibodies, these would actually block the off switches for the immune system. Or we could think about on the left side, like a vaccine, where we're trying to feed these antigen presenting cells a target so that the goal is to try to stimulate an immune response to generate these blue cells. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So when we think about these immune checkpoints that we'll spend a little bit of time on, the important point in terms of thinking about the immune system is it's really a balance between stimulatory signals and inhibitory signals. Um, you know, we have stimulatory signals where, for instance, we have an infection, we want the immune system to turn on. But the other element is we actually want the immune system to be able to turn itself off because if we didn't have that, what we would have is the immune system sort of running away and targeting normal tissue and inducing um, diseases that we call autoimmune diseases. And, um, you know, obviously things like lupus and diabetes, um, these are examples of the immune system gone awry where it's overly active. And so um, we could think about, um, on the one hand, um, uh, having breaks on the immune system and also having gas pedals. And so when we think about these immune checkpoint inhibitors, what we think about is that the tumor basically pushes on the immune system and really suppresses it. And so that's sort of the left side of this balance. And what we really want to do is we want immunotherapies to push on the other side to really um, compensate for this immune suppression that the tumors induce. And so the ways we do that are by either removing the breaks and so the example here is anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1 antibodies, or the alternative is we can actually step on the gas. And so there are other um, drugs that are being developed now to really try to turn on the immune system to basically drive it. So if we go to the next slide. So in terms of immune checkpoint blockade, this is the removing the breaks piece. We now have multiple drugs that are FDA approved um, that target CTLA-4, PD-1, PD-L1. Um, those are both um, interrelated. And as I mentioned, um, you know, these are actually active in a broad range of tumors. And so we actually prescribe these now quite a bit um, in the clinic. And these are the ones that have um, had the greatest impact thus far. So if you scroll down to the next slide. This is uh, the results with regards to anti-CTLA-4 antibodies that got it FDA approved back in 2011. This is metastatic melanoma where patients either got anti-CTLA-4 antibody, um, anti-CTLA-4 antibody with a vaccine, you know, this anti-CTLA-4 antibody is called ipilimumab. And then the third arm just got a vaccine with no ipilimumab. And that's the arm that actually did the worst. It's the lowest of the curves. You can see that both arms that got ipilimumab had improved overall survival. And in fact, 
you know, about 20% of patients actually, you know, benefited from this treatment. Now, you could look at this and say, you know, the glass is half empty or half full. You know, prior to this trial, there was no randomized trial that showed improved overall survival in metastatic melanoma. And so this was a huge watershed moment where an immunotherapy actually now was um, improving survival in a randomized fashion. Um, 20% of the patients got benefit. And those people, actually, you can see how um, the, what we call the tail on the curve is very flat. What we mean by that is that people who actually responded have very durable remissions. And we have now patients, you know, 10, 15 years after receiving these immunotherapies that continue to have no evidence of their cancer coming back. And they're not receiving any additional cancer treatments. And so that's a huge difference than what we typically see with this type of cancer. But obviously, we have a long way to go in terms of trying to improve upon that. If you scroll down to the next slide. This is where, you know, with regards to the next development was these anti-PD-1 antibodies for, in this case, metastatic melanoma. And what this shows is that um, on the top panel on the left, these are what we call waterfall plots. So each of those bars represents an individual patient. And what happens is if you have a patient that has a, a, an amount of tumor at the baseline when they start treatment, and then we scan them after they started treatment, if their tumors have shrank, those bars would actually go down. If the tumors grew, the bars would actually go up. And so if you look on the left side, um, you can see that the majority of patients actually had tumor shrinkage with an anti-PD-1 antibody. Whereas if you looked on the bottom panel, um, the patients with uh, decarbazine, which is a chemotherapy, a much smaller proportion had um, a, a shrinkage of their tumor. And so here, this anti-PD-1 antibody by itself is actually working um, better than chemotherapy and in uh, many respects uh, better than anti-CTLA-4 therapy. If we scroll to the next slide, what happened was um, basically combining these two immune checkpoint inhibitors together. So anti-CTLA-4 antibodies and anti-PD-1 antibodies. And again, this is um, uh, uh, what's called these waterfall plots. You can see the dark blue on the left. That's the combination therapy. And so, you know, 70% of the patients actually had tumor shrinkage with the, uh, the combination therapy. Whereas the panel on the right, which is the light blue, that is the anti-CTLA-4 by itself. And again, about a 10 to 20% response rate with just one of those agents. And so, you know, this really has transformed the way we actually treat um, metastatic melanoma and is now also one of the approved frontline therapies, this combination therapy for, for kidney cancer. So we scroll to the next slide. This is basically looking at uh, um, survival over time. And so you can see uh, anti-CTLA-4 in the green, uh, anti-PD-1 in the blue, and then the combination in the orange. And so, um, you know, there is some benefit to using these two treatments in, in combination. Next slide. The other thing is rather than just combining immunotherapies with other immunotherapies, we can actually combine them with conventional treatments. And so this was a clinical trial um, presented or published last year where an anti-PD-1 antibody pembrolizumab was combined with a chemotherapy for lung cancer. And you can see the blue curve where those patients that got chemotherapy with the anti-PD-1 antibody had a much um, better um, outcome than patients who just got the chemotherapy, which is the red curve. And, you know, the difference in terms of um, uh, benefit is actually quite large. I mean, it was more than any of us would have necessarily um, expected. And again, this is for patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, um, which is typically a lethal um, diagnosis. Um, but now um, a significant proportion of the patients are actually benefiting from this, from this treatment. And this is now the standard of care treatment for this, this lung cancer. Um, 
Combination therapy is also FDA approved for the other flavor of lung cancer, which is small cell lung cancer. That's there. So if we scroll down to the next slide, I'm going to switch gears and actually talk about um, T cell therapies. And so, you know, these immune checkpoint therapies that I mentioned to you rely on a patient already having T cells that can see their cancer and that these T cells are there, but they're basically being suppressed by the tumor. Well, what happens if you actually don't have those T cells that are there? And so one of the goals of T cell therapies is really to try to engineer these T cells so that they can recognize the tumors. And so this is where we've had uh, the most uh, attraction and where we have FDA approved therapies. So if you scroll to the next slide, the first example of um, adoptive T cell therapy was actually um, using what's called TIL therapy. What this is, is you would excise a tumor from a patient and then you would grow the T cells out in the laboratory using these uh, growth factors. And then you would infuse those cells back into the patient. And this is um, an approach that's still under study and hasn't been approved um, but um, clearly there are patients who can respond with this type of treatment. If you scroll to the next slide, the, the T cell therapy that is now FDA approved is what we call the um, chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cell therapies. And um, you know what this therapy is, is basically you now are engineering the T cells so that they have a man-made receptor, that's what this SCFV is, grafted into a T-cell receptor along with a co-stimulatory domain. So it basically really steps on the gas on these T-cells, but it only steps on the gas when these T-cells recognize the tumor cell with that antigen that this um, man-made uh, receptor um, recognizes. And so basically what you're doing is every T cell that we, we've engineered in the patient now can go out and kill these tumor cells. So if we scroll to the next slide, um, this treatment has um, had the most activity in blood cancers. And so this is in acute lymphoblastic leukemia or ALL. And um, the T cells are engineered to recognize a protein on these leukemia cells called CD19. So that's why this is called CAR19 uh, T cell therapy. And basically what we do is we take blood from a patient with leukemia. Those T cells get sent um, to a company that re-engineers these cells. They get expanded and sent back. And then we re-infuse those cells into um, the patients with leukemia. And so you can see in the middle panel the duration of um, uh, remission um, that about 60% um, of the patients actually have remission that's durable. And, um, you know, these are remissions that now have lasted years. And so this was FDA approved in 2017 for both um, pediatric um, uh, uh, leukemia as well as for non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma. And so it, there's a lot of excitement now in terms of re-engineering these T cells to target other things than CD19. And so we'll, we'll talk briefly about that in terms of challenges. So if you scroll to the next slide, this was actually um, a time-lapse microscopy that showed CAR T cells basically um, killing all these tumor cells there. And unfortunately, I can't get that to go um, um, on, on Rick's uh, computer. But I think, you know, the important aspect is you can see millions of cancer cells being killed within hours of these um, uh, cells being infused. And as you might imagine, when you have that degree of cells being killed, that can actually result in some side effects, some significant life-threatening side effects. And so we really need to support people through um, these, these types of treatment. If you scroll to the next slide. 
So the challenges with these CAR T cells um, is, first of all, can we actually enhance the responses that we're seeing in these leukemias and lymphomas? And, you know, we actually don't know which actual cell types, you know, we engineer a lot of different cells um, with these new receptors. We actually don't know which specific cell population really um, 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 is uh, um, killing the cancer cells. Um, and, you know, there's also a question with regards to um, uh, where in the body these cells are actually acting and are there things that basically can turn these cells off that might induce resistance? And can we also fine tune this activity? Because if we have too much killing, we can actually have significant toxicities. And these can manifest in what we call cytokine release syndrome. This basically is not unlike a person coming in with an overwhelming infection where they have fevers and their blood pressure basically drops and their heart rate uh, um, goes up and it's a life-threatening event. These individuals can also develop neurotoxicity, so they can develop, you know, confusion um, after receiving these cells, and we're not quite sure what actually mediates the neurotoxicity. And then the big question is, can these CAR T cells work for solid tumors? And um, this is where a lot of groups are working on this, including our group, and, you know, the goal is, you know, to, to understand what are the best targets on solid tumors, as well as what are the things in a solid tumor that actually turn off uh, immune cells? So we go if we go on to the next slide, this just highlights you know the final um, treatment approach for cancer immunotherapy that I'll touch upon, which are cancer vaccines. And again, this is really trying to deliver these targets to the antigen presenting cells these light green cells, and then activating them to the dark green cells so that they educate the T cells to go out and target the cancer. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, one of the approaches that really has, um, is being studied quite actively is um, this idea of personalized uh, cancer vaccines. Rick had mentioned um, uh, that, you know, um, our um, friend in common received Cipolus LT or Provenge, that is a cancer vaccine that targets one protein, um, prostatic acid phosphatase, that's expressed on prostate cancer cells. Well, as it turns out, we've, we've now come to realize that cancers can have a broad range of mutations that basically um, screw up their program. And um, these mutations in the, the DNA code give rise to proteins that not only might have um, altered function, but actually could be seen by a patient's immune system. And so now what um, uh, multiple companies and groups are doing is taking a tumor from a patient, sequencing it to figure out what is actually mutated in that cancer, and then making a customized vaccine for those mutations um, and giving those back to patients. And in fact, this type of approach has led to um, clinical responses in, in uh, patients. And now, as I mentioned, multiple companies are trying to um, commercialize this, but this is another area of um, active investigation. If you go on to the next slide, um, this is, you know, where these were the, the points that I just wanted to touch upon. Um, in terms of conclusions, immunotherapy has made a significant progress over the last few years. And importantly, immunotherapy treats the patient and not the tumor. We're really harnessing a patient's tumor to actually, I'm sorry, a patient's immune system to target the cancer. We're not relying on the actual drug um, to target the tumor. In this case, the, the, what's actually killing the tumors is a patient's immune system. The same immunotherapy can actually work in a variety of cancers with very different origins. And so this is very different than thinking about classical cancer therapies, where a lot of those treatments were actually unique to specific cancers. In this case, because we're focusing on turning on the immune system, it can actually work the same treatment against multiple types of cancer. Um, 
immunotherapy is, is demonstrating um, a clinical activity in difficult to treat cancers. If you had asked me, you know, 10 years ago that lung cancer would now be treated with immunotherapy as a first line therapy, I would have never have predicted this. Um, but it really, you know, speaks to the potency of immunotherapy. Um, the next bullet point, if a patient responds, these responses can be durable. And the patients who have tumors that completely disappear, um, you know, some of us believe that these patients may actually be cured, some of these patients. And then the final point, immunotherapy has really become a backbone therapy for many cancers and um, now is no longer just in the realm of research, but really um, in the mainstream. And so the, the final slide I have um, really talks about the challenges. Um, so if you scroll down to the next slide, um, you know, the, the point here is that immunotherapy currently does not work in all cancers. And even when it works, currently it works in a minority of patients in, you know, the more common tumors. Um, we really need biomarkers that will help us identify who can respond to the treatments that we've already got. But, you know, more importantly, we really not need to find ways to develop immunotherapies that are more potent, um, including using combination immunotherapies as well as combining immunotherapies to conventional cancer treatments. And so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll close, and I'm happy to take um, any any questions or thoughts. Well, Larry, I mean, for, for me, that was incredibly enlightening because I think like a lot of people on who are listening in, we hear a lot of these terms but we don't exactly know what they mean. Um, we don't know where that what that little PDL one ligand is doing, and now we actually saw it, and we saw what the anti PDL one is trying to do to it. We we understand better about CAR T, and um, it's just very very enlightening. And I do want to let you all know that um, if you especially if you joined us late, the slides are available for download. Um, of the website from the um, from the event posting, and um, and also there will be a recording posted of this um, in in good time. Um, now, if you have questions, uh, we have quite a few questions already um, that we've gathered. But if you do have questions, you can put them in the chat window. I see there's a couple of questions in the chat window already, but but please feel free to to put your questions in the chat window. Um, and um, my co-moderator and, um, and, and very good friend and fellow board member, Len Sierra, who himself is a, is a uh, retired research pharmacologist, uh, is going to be handling the questions. So he's been hopefully looking and seeing what's come in the chat window. And um, Len, I'll, I'll also... Um, uh, send over to you anything that comes in on email. If you're on the telephone and you have a question and you haven't already submitted it, uh, you can submit it to uh, info, I-N-F-O, info at ancan.org, and we'll try and get it over to Len. And um, with that, I, I'd like to, to bring Len into the, uh, into the frame. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Dr. Fong, excellent lecture. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this for us. So I have I have a few questions. Um, we have, well, firstly, we'd like to ask if you have an opinion on a new Regeneron uh, therapy, REGN5678, a bispecific monoclonal antibody, uh, CD28 and PSMA for prostate cancer. Any comments on that? Do we have you, Larry? Oops, sorry, I was speaking to myself on mute. Um, <laughs> uh, this this is an investigational treatment that's uh, targeting PSMA on a prostate cancer cell and is um, seeking to stimulate um, uh, T cells um, by targeting the CD28. 
I, I, there are multiple clinical trials that are using these bispecifics to stimulate P, um, uh, CD, CD3 T cells um, to target tumors that express the PSMA. And at this point, we don't know if the approach that Regeneron is taking targeting CD28 is going to be similar or different from these other approaches that are targeting CD3 on the T cells. Um, but you know, there's a lot of interest and excitement um, in in these uh, 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 treatments, and we actually have a couple of these clinical trials open at, at UCSF. Uh, but I think in answer to um, the question, at this point, it's too early to know whether that is going to be a better approach than some of the other PSMA-targeted uh, approaches that are out there. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, someone with uh, from someone with Merkel cell carcinoma. Uh, she says, "I know there are treatments such as Keytruda for MCC, uh, yet they're contraindicated for patients with autoimmune diseases. Do you see anything changing in the future for those of us with autoimmune diseases and cancer that will adapt such treatments uh, so that they're an option for us?" Yes. So, um, you know, an important point is that most of the immunotherapy clinical trials do exclude uh, people with autoimmune disease. And, um, you know, the reason for that is this concern with regards to un unleashing or worsening the autoimmune disease with these immunotherapies. And from a perspective of a clinical trial, when you're trying to get a drug approved, you, you want to try to um, reduce your risks for side effects. Now that these drugs are actually FDA approved, we actually have been using these treatments in patients with autoimmune disease. It really depends on what that autoimmune disease is, um, but uh, 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 especially, you know, with a disease like Merkel cell, where, you know, if it's uh, advanced, um, you know, immunotherapy is actually one of the key therapies for that disease, we'll often, you know, balance the risks um, as well as the potential benefit. Um, and um, so long as everybody is aware of the risks, um, and, you know, again, depending on what that autoimmune disease, we may actually offer that immunotherapy to an individual with autoimmune disease. And so um, I, I would, you know, suggest to that individual you know, to, to touch base with their oncologist um, because, you know, we are treating patients with autoimmune diseases with these immunotherapies. And, you know, the key part is if we can actually get a uh, anti-tumor response, so get the tumors to shrink, uh, but then we can actually manage the autoimmune disease while that's happening, um, th that would be really the goal. It's threading a needle a little bit, but, um, you know, this is something that we have done with um, uh, 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 patients, especially receiving standard of care therapy, like for Merkel cell. Oh, that kind of leads into the next question I have, which is that um, are, we, are we better able to manage the autoimmune responses that we we do see when the immune system gets ramped up too much. And and are those uh, adverse effects that you alluded to, like the uh, neurotoxicity, are they reversible? Yeah, so, you know, a critical part with regards to managing these toxicities is early recognition that they're happening. And, um, uh, it, you know, this is something that um, we always, you know, instruct our patients if they develop you know, some of the side effects that, that we worry about to let us know immediately. And what we do is we actually then give the patients drugs that suppress the immune system. A lot of the times that takes the form of steroids. And um, in most patients, uh, those side effects actually go away. Um, the vast majority of patients, you know, these, these side effects are um, responsive to the steroids. But there are a rare individuals where their side effects um, either um, require them to stay on steroids or they may have um, lost, um, you know, 
function of a tissue that the immune system has attacked. And so just in a, as an example, um, one of the tissues that the immune system can sometimes hit is, for instance, the thyroid gland. And so if the immune system hits that tissue and that tissue is no longer functioning, then though that individual may actually need to have um, lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. There are actually a lot of people, you know, walking around who are on thyroid replacement because their immune systems attack their thyroid gland just as an autoimmune disease. But this would be an example of something where there might be, um, you know, something that needs to be managed on a long term um, uh, uh, following the immunotherapy. And again, it's, it's very unusual, but it does happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, you did mention that uh, there is an immunotherapy that is now first line, I think you said, for non-small cell lung cancer. So I assume that's FDA approved. Now, for uh, immunotherapies that are not yet FDA approved, is there any groundswell of support among oncologists for moving the immunotherapies into trials for patients with less advanced stages of disease? Well, you know, er everybody would love to see these um, immunotherapies move earlier and earlier in, in disease. And, um, you know, as an example of that, you know, now in, in melanoma, if you have a melanoma that is, you know, thought to be, you know, uh, at risk for recurring, but, you know, has been cut out, um, you can actually get an immunotherapy as what we call adjuvant treatment. And that is basically to reduce your chances of the cancer coming back. And so, um, you know, th there are multiple studies going on with different cancers that are um, looking to use immunotherapies, even at that state, um, which, you know, one might argue is sort of the lowest disease burden state we, we might have. The thing is, you know, we really need to study these in the context of clinical trials. Um, because we can't assume that, you know, what might happen in late disease might happen in earlier and earlier states of disease. And so, um, you know, we really need that um, evidence in order to get these, you know, treatments approved in that setting. Um, the, as you might imagine, the companies that have these drugs are really keen on moving them to earlier and earlier states of disease. And I think, you know, one of the uh, important elements is that, you know, we now have a lot of, you know, competition and trials really trying to get these therapies into earlier states of disease. And so rather than, you know, getting these treatments off of studies, I would really encourage, um, you know, individuals to, to participate in a clinical trial if, if one is available, because that's really how we establish that the treatment works. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from someone who wants to know, is there a place for immunotherapy right now that you may be aware of for metastatic breast cancer, HR positive, HER2 negative? Yeah, you know, um, the HR positive, HER2 negative breast cancers, um, you know, have been studied with the immune um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, so anti-PD-1 anti antibodies. Uh, Hope Brugo at UCSF um, helped to lead one of those clinical trials. The, the rates of response with the anti-PD-1 antibody is actually pretty low. It's, it's less than 10 percent. Um, um, you know, somewhere on the order of 5% or less. And so, you know, really there's a big push to um, uh, uh, either look at combination therapies um, or to uh, give these immunotherapies earlier, including, you know, in women, um, you know, prior to surgical resection of the breast tumors. Um, but, you know, that is a very challenging disease. Um, you know, in a different subtype of breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, so negative for um, the hormone receptors and for HER2, um, anti-PD-1 or in this case anti-PDL1 antibodies are actually now FDA approved in combination with chemotherapy. 
And so the hope is with other types of breast cancer, we can, um, you know, arrive at other combinations that, that might, um, um, you know, get us, get us there. But right now, um, we typically don't use um, these anti-PD-1 antibodies for women with um, hormone receptor positive um, HER2 negative breast cancer. Can I, can I just add there that um, it's not just women. Um, I think the question came from one of our male um, breast cancer coalition men, Larry. So I just want to yeah. give a nod to the fact that um, that we have a um, gentlemen who are impacted by this disease too. Yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you for for reminding me of that. Um, and you know, certainly, you know, these different treatments, um, um, you know, are you know, to a lesser extent being studied in men just by virtue of, you know, men with breast cancer being um, a, a much smaller population. But a absolutely, um, this is a, a really critically important uh, area of research. Okay, Dr. Fung, um, based on your previous answer that uh, there's a very low response rate for patients who don't have the PD-1 or PDL one biomarkers, uh, is it recommended then that anyone getting the appropriate immunotherapy first have a, a, the tumor uh, genome sequenced to see if they have those um, biomarkers? Yeah, so, you know, assessment of PDL1 in the tumor. So, this is basically the thing, the protein that hits the off switch on the T cell. That off switch is PD-1 on the T cell, and you know what we've been looking for is PDL1 on the tumors. And so, you know, th there's a bit of controversy around that. For certain types of cancers, um, if you stain tumors and you can actually detect the protein there at you know a, a high level, people can benefit from immunotherapy. And, you know, probably the best example of that is in lung cancer, where patients who have high levels of this protein in their lung cancer can respond to um, anti-PD-1 antibodies by themselves. And so I think, you know, in that particular disease, it actually makes sense to have the tumor stained for that. But for a lot of other cancers, that actually has not panned out. So if you look at, for instance, you know, kidney cancer, um, there you know, it doesn't look like expression of PDL1 in the tumor actually makes a big difference in terms of, you know, selecting individuals to receive the immunotherapy. The other component to be aware about is even though having high levels of PDL1 increase your chances of responding to an immunotherapy, that is not the same thing as, um, you know, saying that if you don't have PDL1, you won't respond. It's just your rates of response are going to be lower. And so the critical part is even though an individual might have low levels of PDL1 in their tumor, um, you know, the, the chances of response for certain tumors um, where these drugs are, are approved is not zero. It, it, you know, people still do respond. And so I think a critical part is really, you know, advocating and, you know, administering these treatments and being on the lookout for whether or not, you know, people are, are responding to them or not. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's see, we have anything on the horizon that is going to have a real impact on patients who are already MCRPC? Yeah, and, so... And Related to that is, is there a, quote, best immunotherapy for prostate cancer? You know, right now, this is an area of active research. Um, you know, with the anti-PD-1 antibodies, those response rates are also um, under, um, you know, 10%. Um, you know, that said, I have, you know, patients that I've treated with anti-PD-1 antibodies who've had really dramatic responses. They just happen... Um, infrequently. And so there's a lot of research that we and others are doing um, to try to identify who those men are 
And then there are also um, multiple studies that are combining, um, you know, different treatment modalities to see whether or not we can actually um, improve the, the, the rates of response with an anti-PD-1 antibody. And so not unlike the example that I gave um, with regards to lung cancer, um, we actually have a clinical trial um, that, you know, is combining anti-PD-1 antibodies with chemotherapy or trials that are combining um, anti-PD-1 with other immunotherapies or radiation therapy or, you know, targeted therapies. And so this is an area of very active uh, research. And, you know, unfortunately, we, we don't have the answer as of yes yet. But, you know, the hope is that, um, um, that with all these different trials, um, we'll get to a point where, you know, we'll have a much better idea of how to, um, you know, deliver immunotherapies. Okay, thank you. I have, I, I just have a, um, I want to bring in Do Dr. Robert Bard is listening from New York. And Do Dr. Bard, you submitted a question to us, but I'm not sure exactly what the question is. If, if you would like to turn on your microphone, maybe you want to, to pose it to, um, uh, to Dr. Fong. I'm watching to see if you're still with us or not. But we do want to give you the opportunity. Dr. Bard, by the way, does an awful lot of work with um, with the 9/11 cancers in 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 New York. Are, are you with us, Dr. Bard? Okay, I think he might, might have stepped away. Um, Len, do we have any other questions for um, for Larry? <clears throat> yeah, I have one. Um... At various conferences, we occasionally hear from some urologists slash oncologists, in particular one from the Mayo Clinic, who's extremely negative on Provenge. Um, do you feel that that's warranted? Well, um, you know, I think I think a critical aspect is, you know, Provenge has been shown to improve survival in men with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer in, you know, two randomized, you know, clinical trials. Um, we've had many therapies where we were hoping that there would be activity that unfortunately failed uh, phase three clinical trials, uh, including immune checkpoint inhibitors like ipilimumab. And, um, you know, we also, um, you know, have some evidence that, you know, the anti pdl one antibodies, you know, um, um, are not working in the setting of a randomized, you know, phase three clinical trial. And so, you know, even though, you know, we all might have our biases in terms of what we think may work or not, um, having two trials that, um, show in a randomized fashion improved overall survival, I think is, you know, pretty hard to argue with. That's that's data. Now, you know, these responses that we see with Provenge may not be as dramatic as what we see with other other immunotherapies like our immune checkpoint inhibitors or, you know, CAR T cell therapies. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, those those treatments, um, you know, haven't been validated in, in phase three randomized clinical trials. And so, um, you know, I, I would I would argue that, um, you know, this is the data and um, I can show many examples of negative phase three clinical trials. And so to have two phase three clinical trials show a survival benefit, uh, you know, it's like, asking lightning to strike twice. Um, and so from my perspective, you know, we, we do prescribe, you know, Provenge. I think it's important to, to give it to the right uh, folks. But, um, you know, again, there's clinical evidence that it does uh, provide a benefit to, to patients. The challenge is we don't know who th those individuals are. And that's just, you know, a challenge that we face with that treatment. So it appears that if patients have low PSAs, they seem to respond a lot better, or the overall survival appears to be much better. 
I'm just going to run the new, that new corner. Hold on one second. There we go. Try again. Okay. Try again. Yeah, so you're probably familiar with this, Dr. Fong, that uh, patients with lower PSAs tend to have a much greater overall survival, median overall survival, than those with the higher PSAs. Yes, and so I think, you know, I was alluding to that in terms of thinking about who the right patients are that we, you know, give this treatment to. Right. You know, if, if, if a person has you know, it, advanced disease with, you know, high burden and, uh, you know, disease that's progressing quickly, you know, Provenge is not going to be the right treatment for that person. Right. And then <clears throat> one more Provenge related question. Um, I've heard, and I have no idea what the source was, but I've heard that if someone receives Provenge, they subsequently become ineligible for uh, other immunotherapies. Is there any validity to that? No, no. In terms of the clinical trials that we're involved with um, in prostate cancer, they all allow for Provenge therapy. Um, you know, the reason for that is, you know, Provenge is, you know, an FDA-approved uh, treatment. And so, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what trial this, this person might be thinking of, but um, in terms of the clinical trials that we're involved with um, in prostate cancer, they, they allow for um, Provenge. Okay, that makes sense. Well, Rick, I don't have any more questions. Do you have any? I have one last question for Larry. Um, Larry, you've been now working with Parker Institute for, is it two, three years? Um, what is the most exciting thing in your view that's come out of the Parker Institute to date? Well, you know, a, a, a couple things. One is that, um, you know, the Parker Institute has, you know, pulled together, you know, six centers that um, have uh, a deep expertise in cancer immunotherapy and, um, you know, created opportunities for us to work uh, together. And, um, you know, what that's allowed is, is the second um, uh, point that I'll raise is, you know, we actually now have um, clinical trials um, that are um, incorporating state-of-the-art immunotherapies and um, being uh, run at multiple centers to really accelerate, um, uh, um, you know, accruals of uh, patients, and also to ensure that there's um, uh, state-of-the-art um, mechanistic trials embedded in those trials, so that we can understand what these immunotherapies are doing. And so, you know, the two examples that I'll give there is, you know, firstly, in the setting of pancreatic cancer, um, there is a multi-center trial that just finished up looking at combination immunotherapy in pancreatic cancer. And, you know, results from that study were um, presented at um, the uh, AACR meeting this year um, that looked, you know, pretty exciting. And, um, you know, th that treatment approach is, is moving forward. And that study, um, you know, would not have been possible if one center were trying to do that study on its own. The other example that I'll give is actually in the setting of metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, where, um, you know, we're helping to lead um, what's called a platform clinical trial where um, we're looking at different immunotherapy combinations um, and uh, treating about 15 men per combination and doing these very sophisticated tests to see whether or not we're modulating an immune response and whether or not we're seeing any clinical responses. And in doing so, rather than opening and closing you know, different trials, we now have one trial that basically has multiple arms or cohorts so that we can add new combinations quickly. And because um, you know, this clinical trial is opened at multiple sites, 
it really has accelerated accrual um, to this trial, you know, to the point where, you know, we're completing accrual to cohorts, you know, within a matter of a few months. Um, and so I think, you know, these types of opportunities will hopefully accelerate, you know, the discoveries that will get us over the finish line. Well, I mean, this is such an exciting field. And I think back to when I was first diagnosed back in 2007, um, and we were all astonished. I mean, I think you were there at the presentation that Chuck Ryan made at UCSF to the cancer, the prostate cancer research day and told us about abiraterone and, and how uh, it was attacking um, uh, the, the, the testosterone that the body was making itself, and we were all amazed. And, and I think of that, and then I think of where we are today with this immune therapy, and, and it sounds, it's light years away. So I wonder where we're gonna be 10 years from now. It's, it's incredibly exciting, um, not just for prostate cancer, but for all cancers. And if it wasn't for people like yourself, um, I think we'd all be back in the dark ages. And I think we all want to thank you for this incredible work that you're leading and, and, and the great clinical work that you do. And, and also for serving on the, our advisory board, we thank you very, very much, Larry. It, it's been our pleasure to, to host you tonight. Well, well, thank you very much for that, Rick. I, 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 I do want to emphasize that, um, you know, we, we're, we're part of a team, and that team includes um, um, patients. So, you know, the, the, the folks joining in on the call, in that, you know, we're all after a common goal to really um, develop um, great treatments that will make, um, you know, cancer um, uh, 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 not uh, uh, a thing that people will die from. And we're now on the verge for a lot of cancers of accomplishing that. But it's really through um, uh, working together with everything, both, you know, researchers, physicians, patients, patient families. Um, it really is a, a huge um, team effort here. And, um, you know, I, I also want to thank uh, you and, you um, um, all of the folks on, on the call, um, because, you know, this is one of um, our big motivators, but also you guys are, are critically important to to um, what we're all trying to accomplish. And so uh, I wanted to thank you, too. Thank you. Thank, thanks. Thanks a million, Larry. And hopefully it won't be such a long time till I hear your voice again. Hope to see you soon. Uh all right. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. We will post this um, hopefully within 24 hours. We'll post it on the website so you can listen again and benefit from this um, immense amount of knowledge that uh, has, has been uh, offered to us. And um, just a, a quick word, by the way, for those of you who, who aren't regulars with ANCAN, um, we're now offering 17 groups a month including um, uh, a new non-cancer group for MS. So anybody, um, if you know any MS people, please send them to our website. Uh, we've got a couple more uh, new groups lined up coming very soon, hopefully one for young cancer survivors and another for sarcoidosis. Uh, and we are expanding all the time. So uh, there'll be new and there'll be plenty of old and um, we thank you all for your support and for attending tonight. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.